Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to another video in our series on IGCSE Geography. In today's lesson, we will be looking at Theme 3, Challenges of an Urbanizing World. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Firstly for today, what is an urban area? The world can basically be divided into rural and urban areas. Rural areas tend to have a small population density and a large proportion of open, green spaces. Rural people may work in agriculture, tourism, or running shops in the local village. Urban areas tend to be towns and cities, with large population density and limited open green spaces. Urban residents tend to work in offices, factories, or running services in the city. Firstly, let's recap population density. Population density is a measure of how spread out the population is. For example, for the same square area of land, how many people live in each region? Both low density and high density areas face their own problems. Regions with a high population density are at more risk from disease and the large number of people living there can cause greater pressure on resources such as the internet, electricity, and water. Think about how your internet speed becomes slower with more people in the house. This is the same for water supplies, food, and electricity. Areas with low population densities can face similar issues with resources but the problems they face are usually due to access and the difficulty providing the resources to remote locations. More of the world's population is living in urban areas. Cities are expanding and the urban population is growing. This infographic shows each country's urban population in millions and the percentage of their entire population that live in urban rather than rural. Many high-income countries have large urban populations. 81% of the US's population live in urban towns and cities, whereas 90% of the UK's population live in urban areas. In comparison, in low-income countries and developing countries over half of the population live in urban areas, for example, Turkey has 68% of its population living in urban areas. This is less than in high-income countries, but these urban populations are rapidly growing. However, just because a country has a small proportion of people living in urban areas doesn't mean their population is small. Have a look at India. Only 29% of India's population live in urban towns and cities, however, India has two megacities that each have a population of 21 million, which is the same as Sri Lanka's entire population. The world's urban population is growing and will continue to grow in the future. Urban cities will grow at an accelerated rate in developing countries, whereas the urban population in developed cities will grow more gradually. That brings us to megacities. Megacities are defined as cities with populations of over 10 million people. This is larger than some countries' entire population, Greece, Sweden, Israel, New Zealand, for example. Megacities can be found across the world but are especially concentrated in South Asia. Some megacities steadily grow, so their infrastructure, things like water supplies, food, doctors, and schools, can cope with the population growth and there is little inequality. This is the case for Tokyo and Los Angeles. However, some megacities have rapidly expanded. Sometimes, this means that not all the residents can be looked after and the infrastructure is under high pressure. This leads to inequalities, where some residents live in luxury apartments whereas others live in squatter settlements. For example, Mumbai and Mexico City are rapidly growing megacities. That brings us to the topic of world cities. Some cities have global influence, even if their urban population isn't as large as a megacity. These cities are called world cities and they demonstrate their influence in a number of ways. Firstly, political decisions. Leaders of world cities make decisions that can impact other areas of the world. 
Whether that is being allied to another country or adopting more sustainable policies, many governments follow the example of these cities. Secondly, migration and travel. World cities tend to have large international airports that see many tourists, business people, and migrants passing through. Cities that are common stop-off points or transfers for long-haul flights are important international airports, such as Dubai and Singapore. Thirdly, businesses. A city can be a hub for local and international businesses. Transnational companies, or TNC, want to have their headquarters in world cities, as they are more easily connected to the rest of the world, and the reputation of having their headquarters in a world city adds to their brand. Headquarters of financial companies, banks, and technology firms are especially reputable. Cities want the best businesses to locate their offices here. We need to look more closely at urban economies. Economies in cities and towns can be the driving factor for change. Declining economies need government intervention whereas growing economies attract attention, migration, and investment. Developing and developed countries have different characteristics to their economies. These characteristics are based upon the kind of work their population does. For instance, developed countries tend to have a large proportion of formal workers, where workers have contracts. Whereas developing countries have a large proportion of informal workers, who find their own work or are self-employed. There are pros and cons to formal and informal work. Let's look closer at formal work. Workers agree to a contract with their employer, which in most instances ensures a regular wage and safe working conditions. Formal work includes such jobs as teachers, doctors, and dentists, and office workers. In the UK, for example, employers are responsible for the safety and welfare of their workers. Employees should receive PPE and training to do their job safely. Due to unions and the advent of workers' rights, employees are guaranteed certain levels of pay, contracts, holiday and sick pay, flexible working, and parental rights. However, formal work is competitive and often requires the correct qualifications for the job. Therefore, workers who don't have a degree or formal qualification or the appropriate experience won't get the job. In addition, formal work often doesn't give flexibility with hours, and time off for holidays is limited. Okay, now let's look at informal work. Informal work includes any job that is temporary, with limited regulations, or self-employed jobs. Informal work includes things like street sellers, house help, and cleaners, and rag picker. Whatever an informal worker earns, they get to keep. So the number of hours they work will reflect how much they earn. However, their wage isn't guaranteed and so they could have days where they don't earn a penny. There is no contract, so workers are vulnerable to exploitation. Businesses don't protect their workers' health, overwork them or send them more dangerous work. Informal workers don't pay the correct amount of tax if any, so the government cannot benefit from their work. Let's look more closely at the changing urban populations. Urban cities can change shape and characteristics. Over time, all cities will grow and decline for a variety of reasons. Often, the city depends on net migration and the distance commuters will travel to work in the city. Let's talk about this rural-urban migration. Most urban cities around the world are growing. This may be because the population on a whole is growing if the global birth rate is higher than the global death rate, more people are being born than dying. This is because Healthcare and medical knowledge are improving, especially in low-income countries. Many countries, especially in South Asia, have built better warning systems for natural disasters, so fewer lives are lost. Better knowledge of midwifery, which reduces pregnancy fatalities and government policies that allow time off and better care in workplaces for pregnant women. In addition, urban populations are growing more rapidly than rural populations. This is because some rural workers migrate to an urban city for work opportunities and a better quality of life. This is called rural-urban migration. An individual might feel pushed from their rural home and pulled towards living in an urban city, through push and pull factors. Examples of push factors Rural jobs are mainly in farming. This is intensive work and not well paid. 
Climate change is making farming more difficult. The soil is becoming poorer quality, through desertification, and droughts are more common, leading to frequent crop failures. In rural towns and villages, access to services is limited. Families may have to travel far to their local hospital or school. Rural towns tend to be isolated because they are far away from a nearby city. This means electricity, water, and food supplies are limited and the town must rely on themselves rather than import supplies in. Examples of pull factors In the city, there are higher paid jobs and more opportunities, since there are many more businesses located here. Better education for children, as many colleges and universities are located in cities rather than rural villages. Public transport allows residents to be more mobile, even if they can't afford a car. Residents don't need to travel as far for hospitals and medical care. City life is more entertaining, with more shops, cinemas, clubs, and restaurants than in rural villages. However, not all pull factors are as they seem. People can decide to migrate based on a dream or reputation. Sometimes, when they arrive in the city, the reasons that they moved away from home for aren't true. The next topic we need to look at is suburbanization. As the city builds, some residents would prefer a quieter quality of life. For example, individuals may want to move away from the city center and towards the suburbs of the city. So, what would the reasons to move to the suburbs be? Less traffic congestion, so quieter lifestyle. More land per house, so houses have gardens, larger rooms and spare bedrooms. You can afford a car. The lower crime rate, making it safer to raise families in the suburbs. More leisure facilities and green open spaces. Governments can encourage suburbanization by building new transport links to the periphery of the city, as well as allowing new housing developments on greenfield lands surrounding the city. However, suburbanization increases the size of the city and could become too sprawling with too few services and facilities, which would impact the quality of life for residents. For example, if builders construct more houses but not more doctor surgeries, residents will have poor access to medical care which could impact their health and life expectancy. How about counter-urbanization? If a city becomes too large and has too many problems, residents may want to move away from the city. This is the opposite of urbanization, where people want to move into the city, which is why we call it counter-urbanization. So, what are some of the reasons to move to the city? Houses and apartments are high cost. Whereas you can afford larger property in the countryside. Jobs in the city are filled, so new job opportunities are limited. Limited leisure facilities and small parks, so few places to exercise or walk your dog. Schools are too full, so there are too few teachers to students and limited choice in schools. Roads are congested leading to air pollution and unpleasant commutes. Increasing crime rates, vandalism, and terror attacks in the city. Next topic, deindustrialization. Some cities can have declining economies, where businesses leave the city or become bankrupt. This can have an impact on everyone's life in the city. Workers can lose their jobs if the business is moving far out of town. The higher the levels of unemployment, the more competitive getting a new job is and the fewer job opportunities are available. If a household loses its income, it may be unable to afford commodities such as going out to the restaurant or buying new clothes. Therefore local businesses lose profit and could close which would lead to further unemployment. In the worst cases, if a household loses its income the family could be left without food or evicted from their homes. Homelessness will increase. Deindustrialization can damage the quality of life and the reputation of a city. This may be because of the high unemployment, dereliction of old industrial buildings, or rising levels of crime in the city. Deindustrialization has greatly impacted the city of Detroit in the USA. Here, the murder rate is four times higher than New York and an employment rate that peaks at 32% of its population is unemployed. How about urban land use? Cities tend to follow a pattern of similar structures. 
Land in the city is used for different purposes, residential, industrial, or commercial which depends on the characteristics of the land. Cities look like tree rings, with the oldest buildings in the center and the youngest buildings on the outside or periphery. Industry forms small wedges, spanning the center of the city to the periphery. Alongside major transport links. Things such as motorways, train lines, and canals for shipping. The center of any city is called the Central Business District or CBD, which is the location for many shops, restaurants, tourist attractions, and office blocks. Most workers in the city have jobs in the center of the city and will commute from anywhere across the city to the center each day. The most expensive houses tend to be found in the nearest ring to the CBD. These used to be the oldest housing estates, but many become derelict and replaced with new building developments. These new apartments are constructed to attract high-income investors and business managers, who want to be close to work and enjoy the city lifestyle. Low-income families can't afford to live in the center of the city, so they tend to live towards the periphery. They must commute into the city for work and shops, but the house prices are cheaper and there is better access to schools and supermarkets around the periphery of the city. However, this is a simplified model of the city. In fact, some cities can look more complicated than this model. In developed cities, housing developments around the periphery become attractive for middle-income families. This is because the land is cheaper on the periphery, houses can be larger but workers can still commute to work in the city center. In addition, commuter villages can become linked with the city, offering a quieter quality of life for those who can afford a car to commute into town. In developing cities, the structure of the city is rearranged. The poorest families live on the very periphery of the city, often on unfavorable land, things like steep hills, or next to railways, in shanty towns. Transport doesn't reach the periphery of the city, so the shantytown residents cannot commute easily into the city center and often have to walk early in the morning. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share and comment below so we can clarify things for you.